our live webinar presentation, State of Health Plan Subrogation, Expert Tips on Maximizing Subrogation Success. Today's webinar is co-sponsored by Conduit. As payers look to uncover every possible recovery opportunity, identifying the proper liable party for payment of health care services is essential. This webinar will discuss the current state of health plan subrogation, use of internal and external subrogation services, key challenges with both approaches, and how to maximize subrogation return on investment. We're pleased to welcome our speakers, Deborah Whaley, Ryan L. Woody, and Mara Garrick, Director of Subrogation Recovery Operations. Deborah Whaley is Senior Executive Subrogation Analyst, Benefits Division with Trustmark Companies based in Lake Forest, Illinois. Deborah has significant subrogation expertise with over two decades of experience with Trustmark. Ryan L. Woody, partner Mathieson, Wickard and Lair, concentrates his practice on complex defense and subrogation litigation. Ryan is nationally recognized for subrogation, reimbursement, lien resolution issues, and healthcare defense, especially ERISA and Medicare Advantage. Ryan represents clients in numerous federal courts and arbitrations around the country. Mara Garrick, Director of Subrogation Recovery Operations, Conduent, is responsible for overseeing all aspects of subrogation recovery. She joined Conduent in 2000 and has held her current position as Director of Subrogation Recovery Operations since 2008. Today's moderator is Clive Riddle, President, MCOL. We're now ready for our speakers to begin. Well, welcome everyone. This is Clive Riddle, president of MCOL. I'm your moderator today, and, and thank you to all our attendees for joining us, and thank you to our speakers. I want to welcome you and uh, provide you just a quick opportunity to share a little more on your subrogation background. And Deb, Deborah Whaley, why don't we start with you? Can you give our listeners a quick overview of, of Trustmark subrogation program and, and your role? Hey, thanks, Clive, and good afternoon, everyone. Yes, um, as the introductory video uh, mentioned, I have a little over two decades of subrogation experience. Um, I started with uh, Trustmark back in 1997, and prior to that, I was a paralegal in a private law firm, so I was on the other side of the insurance world with that. Um, but yes, yeah, so in 2006, um, we decided to outsource uh, our subrogation services to a vended solution. Uh, prior to that, I managed an in-house fully staffed subrogation department. And um, what we decided to do was to outsource. We found that it was going to uh, yield a, a better benefit from our services. And um, so what we did during that, prior to outsourcing, we had a pen and pursue program with our claim payment. And as I said here, we had a game changer. Once we outsourced, we went to a pay and chase and program and within our subrogation services, which yielded a much better result, both for our vendor and for our clients, getting those liens out faster, as you all know. And what we really like to do as far as in our program, and this has evolved over the years, one thing that we've learned is knowledge truly is power. And so we've developed educational programs for our client relation teams, including our employee service representatives, as well as brokers and some of our larger clients as well, to give them a good foundational understanding of what subrogation is and the benefits of it. Um, my responsibilities within the unit is to oversee the activities of our vendor. Um, I do lead the internal and external programs that I just, just uh, described regarding education. And then also just to have a good um, accountability, we also have a vendor audit program where our staff does audit the activities of our vendor to make sure everything's looking appropriate. Um, I'm also the senior business liaison in our department. And so I'm the one, if things get escalated or I will be the face of, uh, of the department so that if there's any issues or we have any client interface, I'm the point person for that. So I like to call myself a subrogation nerd because believe it or not, I love subrogation. <laughs> Thanks, Clyde. Thank you, Deborah. And uh, Maura, Yurki, why don't we go to you next? We know uh, Conduit is a subrogation vendor, but uh, could you elaborate on the aspect of uh, Conduit's work that you oversee? Sure. Thanks, Clive. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, 
A little broader introduction for those of you unfamiliar with Conduent, we do provide technology solutions and business processes support to all of key healthcare's key stakeholders, payers, providers, governments, and pharma and life sciences. And that includes a complete range of payment integrity services, including COB, credit balance services, pharmacy audit, and ultimately subrogation services. And Conduent Subrogation Services entered the subrogation industry over 34 years ago as Primex Recoveries. Some may be familiar with that name. Um, and the majority of our core operations management team are still around from the Primex days. So we definitely have some, some tenure in our management team. Uh, in my role leading the subrogation operations, I'm responsible for monitoring productivity metrics and audit protocols partnering with our client management team to ensure client satisfaction and collaborating with our in-house legal support team on staff education. Well, thanks, Maura. And Ryan, um, Ryan Woody, can you share with our listeners uh, a brief overview of your role in uh, working with healthcare payers to support their subrogation needs? Sure, um, thanks, Clive. Uh, yeah, so our firm is uh, well headquartered here in Wisconsin, where I am. Uh, we've got offices around the country. I've been doing this uh, here at Matisse and Wickert and Lair since 2004. Uh, man, time flies, really it does. Um, so <laughs> uh, primarily, I'm working with payers, TPAs, uh, recovery vendors uh, to support really their overall subrogation needs, and whether it's um, drafting plan language from the start or you know, litigating a, a, a high profile case uh, at the end of a file. Um, you know, given our really our, our national reach with all our offices, we're able to and have handled really cases in, in just about every jurisdiction in the country. So um, so whether it's, you know, filing a last minute lawsuit to stop disbursement of funds or, you know, responding to um, uh, defending a lawsuit to uh, avoid a lien, you know, we've really seen it all. And so we've kind of got that full breadth of of, of litigation experience. Thanks, Ryan. So now we're going to close our slides and just go for a little bit into a panel discussion. And uh, I'd like to uh, start really while we're talking to you, Ryan, with you. And I, I know Matheson, and Wickard, and Lair produce and maintain a, a lot of information on health insurance subrogation across the country. So I'm hoping you can uh, start by summarizing some of the latest trends and challenging challenges that you're seeing in healthcare subrogation. And uh, in particular, you know, are there states that are troublesome? And, and again, what trends you, you see is really in the forefront? Sure. Um, well, if, just, just to begin, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll piggyback on your questions. We do uh, believe in education pretty strongly here, and we've got uh, a lot of resources that uh, those of you uh, listening in, um, can, uh, can, can access for free off our website. We, um, we publish a pretty dense book. I mean, uh, probably 600 plus pages on health insurance subrogation uh, in all 50 states uh, through Juris Publishing. So feel free to go on our website, check out the resources. Um, they're there for, for everyone's free use. Um, as far as trends go, um, you know, I, I think I'd have to kind of break those down between types of uh, plans or, you know, the, the book of business we're talking about. And uh, at least on the fully insured side, I think that we're seeing, um, you know, uh, the landscape is, is, is increasingly more difficult. Um, you know, we, we've got some additional recovery uh, obstacles. Uh, I'll give one example. Just uh, this past year uh, out in Washington is um, they've really tightened up their made whole doctrine and uh, Washington Supreme Court there in a case called Kuhn versus Group Health, basically put the uh, the burden squarely on uh, the insurer in all situations to prove made whole. Um, and they made it even more difficult for us to get the information that we needed to, uh, to do a made whole analysis. So, you know, uh, even though that just came out, we're, we're already seeing the effects of, of that type of a decision where, you know, insurer, the attorneys are just refusing to cooperate with us, give us the information we need. Um, and then when we do ask for these, uh, these items, they're threatening, you know, bad faith lawsuits. So Washington was already bad, but I think it's, it's, it's even, it's even worse now. And that's, I, I think that's indicative of a lot of the trends that we're seeing on, at least on the fully insured side is even, um, pro subrogation states are, are, are introducing more, uh, anti subrogation statutes, rules, and, uh, stricter made whole, uh, requirements, uh, 
So on the on the self funded side, I think I've got a little bit of a different opinion. I'm not really seeing a any sort of widespread new litigation trend or legal arguments. Uh, we're seeing a lot of a lot of the same, but but I think the trends that I'm seeing are more maybe process based as the way they affect our our, our practices. Um, we're seeing uh, a, a, an increase, at least I am, on plaintiff-sided lien resolution vendors coming in to the process of the file. And uh, I'm seeing that at an increased, increased frequency and earlier on in, in the file uh, life cycle. And I think that um, their effect really has a, 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 an impact on, on the productivity of, of your file because what they're, they're trying to do is really wear you down, right? Um, and so they don't really have the law on their side, but they're coming in, trying to slow down, bog down your processes, hassle the group for unnecessary documents, and really create as much chaos as they can. Um, one of the recommendations that I have for uh, clients is to make sure that you flag these cases and reassign them to your strongest people, um, or potentially, you know, outsource them, um, either to, to recovery vendors or to uh, firms like mine so that you can, you know, focus your resources on, on the cases that won't, you know, bog down, bog you down. Um, the other recommendation that I have more from a litigation standpoint is that, um, you know, when it comes to lien resolution vendors, precedent matters with them. They know what you did on the last case or the last uh, file for that group. They've got spreadsheets to, to the, tell them, you know, here's what you did last time. So you, you can kind of flip that cycle and turn it on them. And really do, in order to break that cycle, I find that you know, filing a test lawsuit is really the best, best way to kind of break them up. Because if you file suit on a case uh, to kind of, you know, as a test case really, uh, that breaks their model down. You know, the, the attorney who hired them is back in the picture and the vendor may lose their, their lien resolution fee. So showing them that you have the ability to litigate is, uh, is really something that will have an effect um, not only on the file but going forward. So that that's kind of my uh, I guess my trend that I've identified um, on the on the self funded side. Got it, Ryan. And again, do you see any states being particularly troublesome in 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 what you've talked about? Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, I, I think everyone that's listening knows what the problem states are. Georgia's always a problem state. And, and that doesn't really, I mean, the law in Georgia hasn't changed. It's always been bad, but you know, they're a state where the, um, at least from the attorney standpoint, there's not an ethical rule in Georgia that requires them to hold the funds in trust till they resolve the lien. Um, and so that, that runs us into, into some problems with um, just being unable to negotiate a resolution without potentially having to run into litigation. Um, you know, and then there's, you know, we can all name the, the, the anti-segregation states off. Um, but, but I would say Washington right now is, is, is being a problem for us. And, and um, California always is, you know, <laughs> there's just a lot of interesting characters out there. Um, and I think it's more, more driven by, um, by some of those personalities on the, on the plaintiff side, uh, rather than geography at this point. All right. Thanks, Ryan. Deborah Whaley, we're going to go back to you. Again, Deborah um, informed us today her, uh, her title, her un unofficial title is Subrogation Nerd. And uh, Deb, what, what have you seen in terms of challenges in the states that you work with? Well, definitely just to echo what Ryan just said, yeah, these lien resolution companies have really become our worst nightmare and I think they know it too. So you just got to stand your ground with them. And um, I love Ryan's idea, have that test trial case out there just to shake them up a little bit. But absolutely, the um, anti-subrogation states or the states that have statutes that restrict um, subrogation in some form or fashion are definitely the challenges. Pennsylvania, theirs is just um, focused on motor vehicle accidents, but probably any company's um, case inventory, that's going to be the largest percentage of your overall um, case volume is going to be that. So where I see that is, you know, you have those states. Um, where I see a lot of the difficulty is sometimes dealing with the, the plaintiff's attorney who may be fairly new or is not used to dealing with ERISA qualified plans. When you have good plan language that definitely um, 
you know, disavows any of the uh, restrictions and that state may have and, you know, trying to educate um, a young attorney on, you know, what a risk of qualified plan is governed by federal law, not by your state law. And so that's where we kind of um, hit some road bumps at times. And that's where our challenges are within those states. Thanks, Deborah. Mm -hmm. so, so Maura, um, you know, you're working with clients and issues all across the country. Are, are there any states or subrogation issues that you find particularly challenging or interesting? Well, I will definitely agree with the response regarding the lien resolution companies. Um, as Ryan and, and Deb both mentioned, they they make our jobs very difficult and they definitely do know it. So we have to come up with creative ways of kind of keeping them in their lane, so to speak. Um, so that's definitely one of the challenges that we face. Uh, one of the other challenges we face uh, that hasn't been touched on here is limited settlement proceeds. Um, this can come from low policy limits. Um, you know, a lot of people carry minimum limits on their auto policy, for instance. And if there's some pretty serious injuries and low limits, we're kind of stuck when it comes to the amount we can recover. It can also be caused by disputed liability or various other reasons. Um, you know, when we face situations of limited settlement proceeds, we have to do our negotiations to recover as much as possible, but it often puts us in a position where we have to go back to our clients and explain and educate them on the reasons why the potential recovery is less than they believe they're entitled to. Um, another challenge we, we deal with is non-responsive parties. So there are those attorneys out there that don't wanna to speak to us, don't wanna to respond to our letters. Um, there's insurance adjusters who just don't respond. So that puts us in a tough position. And in some situations we end up um, having to reach out to the member, which is always, our last resort, um, but when we are trying to protect our client's interest, we sometimes end up having to go that route to make sure that we're getting the responses that we need. Um, and then, as the others have mentioned, the anti subro states, tough state laws and, and case law that, that limit our rights. Again, that does, um, as, as Deb and Ryan both mentioned, kind of hinge on the kind of plan we're dealing with. So obviously, you know, with a self-funded ERISA plan, we're in much better negotiation position than we are with an insured plan or a non-ERISA plan. Um, but from our perspective, we have very detailed training created by our in-house legal support team so that our, our staff are armed with what they need to to handle those situations. Thanks, Maureen. I, I liked uh, your reference to keeping people in their lane. <laughs> and also, uh, I haven't really thought about uh, what you mentioned about, you know, being ghosted by, uh, you know. Yes, it definitely happens. Okay, so Ryan, this has made me think about, you know, when we talk about litigation, what, what percent of, of subrogation claims warrant litigation? And, and whatever that number is, do you think it's gonna change much in the coming few years? Yeah. Um, so I, again, it, it, I think it depends on, on, you know, geography, what we're talking about. Uh, it can certainly vary um, it, depending upon where you're writing or where your clients are. Um, but, you know, nationally, it's a, it's a rather low percentage. Um, I would, I would, I would probably peg it between one and maybe at max 3% if you're at, if you're in a, if you're pegged in a location that, that is more litigious than others. But they're not going to be, you know, you're not litigating every file. Um, and, and obviously, we want to carve out states like Wisconsin and Ohio, right, where you're, you're joined to a party as a party to the lawsuit, because because then you're in those those type of cases more frequently. But they should be a very small percentage of your overall book of business. Um, if you're finding that they're more than that, there's probably something else that's going on that, that, that can be addressed. But um, yeah, it, it should be a low percentage. I don't know if that's what everyone else is experiencing, but maybe. Okay, no, I, I appreciate hearing that. Um, so, so Deborah, you know, what if we talk about the non-litigation side, and also though, uh, Deborah, maybe you can comment on, on what Ryan just said, if, if those numbers sound you know, about to what you've seen. But for the non-litigation, what makes it easier to resolve subrogation claims without litigation? Do you have any tips or tricks to, to share? Yeah, first of all, just to go back to Ryan's comment, absolutely agree with him. Very, very small percentage of your overall inventory is going to end up in litigation. Of, of course, that's what we want. 
Um, it also, those that end up, I think um, over the years, you just kind of learn the personalities. You've got some uh, law firms, that's just their go-to. That's what they want to do. But I think overall, as long as, you know, we're providing, working with a plaintiff's attorney, providing them what they need as far as the lien, updated benefits, any claim copies, medical records, EOBs, getting them the things that they need to help build their case, I think is in, in establishing that trust and that working relationship is huge, you know, in that. And um, I, I just think from our perspective, as far as a TPA, just doing what we can, providing that information in a timely manner, and just, you know, having good communication throughout the life of the case is, is critical. Appreciate that, Deborah. So Maura? Let, let me throw that same uh, those same questions to you. If you think uh, Ryan's numbers sound about right from your experience, and then what do you see as as making it easier to you know resolve claims when litigation isn't involved? I would absolutely agree with Ryan. Um, across our entire book of business, I would say it's probably less than one percent that ends up in litigation um, for a variety of reasons, but. You know, like Ryan mentioned, you don't want to litigate every case um, because one, one, one of the points to consider there is potentially creating bad case law for us. You know, we, we want to make sure that we the facts are strongly on our side and that the, the, the arguments are in our favor, because all it takes is one judge to say, you know what, we we don't agree with you. And now the entire subrogation industry is dealing with the fallout from that decision. So, you know, the, the decision to litigate has to be made very carefully. And we Obviously, there's also a cost involved, so we try to avoid that where, where we can. Um, and I don't know that it's necessarily easier to resolve claims than it has ever been, um, but you know, we, we make sure that the staff are trained as thoroughly as possible to be able to negotiate um, and articulate support for payment of the lien um, with justification so we can avoid litigation um, and, and try to not even bring that into the picture, if at all possible. Well, thanks, Maura. So now we're going to bring up a slide again on the subrogation process. And uh, Maura, as this comes up, um, I'm going to be asking you to comment on it. And, and could you take our audience through this process and highlight the, the successful elements of each phase as you go through the subrogation process? Sure. So the first key is effective and efficient case identification. It's done by utilizing data analytics, refining algorithms. So you're identifying claims with the highest probability of being related to a subrogatable event. Taking that important first step leads to a much more targeted and efficient investigation into the episodes of care and making sure that you are identifying all possible opportunities. Once you've completed identification, thorough investigation needs to be done to determine the involved parties, whether it be members, attorneys, liability carriers, anyone involved in the underlying claim and validating that information and validating that it is a, a viable recovery opportunity. And then obviously the final key element is effective negotiation and recovery. So ultimately bringing the money in the door. Um, making sure the staff handling those cases has as much information as possible so they can successfully negotiate the highest possible recovery. And you know that includes understanding the legal environment, applicable state and federal laws, applicable case law, and, and, and utilizing um, legal resources to make sure that they're able to recover as much as possible. Okay, so now, um... After, and again, thanks, Maura, for that. Ryan, let, let's uh, look at it from your perspective. Um, what are the necessary components needed to support subrogation recovery, you know, with consideration of this process? So, you know, speaking from a litigation perspective, so we're at the end of that, uh, that process there of that chart. You know, I can tell you what, what I look for when I'm consulting with clients on potential new cases. Um, what, First, I'm looking for what I, I guess I would call as a gapless subrogation file. So I, I want to know, I'm trying to, to tell the client, you know, is this, is this going to be a positive subrogation recovery if we take it to litigation? And, you know, in a, in a litigated case, the subrogation file is going to be scrutinized. 
and any missteps are going to be magnified. So I'm looking for any big gaps in the file or, or, or potential uh, mistakes. Were, were the notices late? Did the claims handler change in the middle? And so we missed some communications. Um, did we, you know, fail to timely respond to requests for the lien or a final lien um, for documents? Um, you know, so we want to flag those problems before we file a lawsuit and before they become big, big problems for us. Because if we if we can flag them early, the, the maybe it won't become problems, or we can, you know, pivot to a different strategy. Um, and then the second thing that I'm I'm looking for, maybe this is more of a uh, a practical uh, 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 element, but I think it also, uh, I've got some examples maybe that, that might bring it to life is that we're looking for good communication. Um, and, you know, different payers use different um, uh, structures and as to how that they're, maybe they might be doing it in-house. Uh, they might be doing subrogation, uh, you know, through a, a subrogation vendor. Um, there, there, there's often several links in that chain, whether it's from the group to the TPA to the subrogation vendor. Um, and then there's probably a stop loss carrier out there who's got some, uh, some input. And so I want to make sure that we're all on the same page and there's some good communication um, with all the stakeholders. Because oftentimes the lack of that communication uh, will have negative consequences in the case, actually, because now, let me give you two examples, and I, I really don't have to go back far to get them. These are recent and fairly, one is more common, uh, I see it, and, and the second is, is something I don't see, but, you know, it's, I could see how it could get missed. So we had a case recently where, um, you know, the, the lien was being challenged uh, based on a state law that we didn't think applied, and so the, the, the TPA and the, and the subrogation vendor, you know, went back to the group and said, you know, they're not going to repay us. We need to get authority to litigate the case. Um, and that, that authority came. Uh, and then we uh, ended up uh, actually, in this case, responding to a suit that was filed uh, against the, the plan. But it came out later uh, because there was not good communication between all of the, the stakeholders that the employee had gone into the HR department, met with the CEO, and the CEO who didn't understand the difference between the plans interest and stop loss interest and how that all worked together um, ended up being recorded legally uh, and waiving subrogation of the plans interest. So that's a unique situation, but it's, it's, it's that had there been proper communication, everyone would have known that this was a conversation that had happened in the past. And that was likely relevant to what we were doing in the in the subrogation lawsuit. Mm -hmm. um, and then the second, maybe more common uh, lack of communication is is where we have a lot of these divided functions, and the uh, plaintiff's lawyer will send or the the lien resolution vendor will send that letter, that three or four page letter with uh, mm -hmm. seven million document requests under the statute that they that they think that applies, um, and and. Oftentimes, the TPA or the vendor will say, no, that's not our obligation. We've been told to refer all of those document requests back to the plan administrator. Um, and so then there's radio silence on the subrogation file. But, you know, if you don't have communication with the plan administrator, you won't know that the, the attorney did follow up and he sent that request um, directly to the plan administrator, didn't copy you, didn't tell you about it. And the plan administrator didn't respond because they thought, well, we've, that's what we've got our TPA for, right? And so, you know, you get set up with this situation where the request has been outstanding for a month or, for, excuse me, for a year or, or two years, and you're looking at potential, you know, penalties if you were to file suit, there might be a counterclaim. And so that's why I say that I'm looking for good communication between all of the, the stakeholders because, you know, we don't know what's going to come in litigation. There's a lot of, um, Unknown unknowns. <laughs> Appreciate that, Ryan. And, and uh, I think it's a great takeaway talking about the communication. So, Deborah, um, you know, from a payer perspective, what do you think is the most challenging about pulling together these elements for your subrogation program? Well, the first thing I think is, you know, we've, we're representing our clients, our people that are out in the world of running their own businesses, you know, day after day, and segregation isn't something that's really on their radar. So 
when we, you know, when we need to reach out to them for something, um, that gets really challenging where they don't understand. And, and I, going back to what I had mentioned earlier about education, um, really trying to push things out, even in their own company newsletters, information about segregation. And so that their employees, the members understand, you know, the obligation contractually they have once they receive payment on a benefit on a claim, um, there then arises the a responsibility for them to repay us, um, repay their uh, employer. So um, working with that, but the main thing I think is knowing your client. We have such a diversity of clients and some of them have very rich employer plans. And so they may not want to be approaching things in um, too much of an aggressive way. So balancing that, then where you have a plan that says, yeah, go get them. You know? So um, knowing your client, knowing their culture and um, bringing the understanding of what the service is, why it is important to them and their bottom line as far as getting those benefit dollars back into their accounts and how critical what we do, it really is for their overall success. And we wanna set up our vendor for success as well with this program. So talking to the plans about having very strong plan language, as I mentioned earlier, that addresses some of the issues that um, the plaintiff's attorney may come at us for, you know, where we disavow the made whole, we disavow um, attorney fund doctrine. We, we go, we have that all in the plan document. But not only having that, what we've had a problem with um, is having them that plan fully execute their plan document, sign off on it so that we have a fully signed and data plan document. And so that's a program we work with very strongly is making sure we have everything that we need to set up um, our vendor for when they do take over a case for us. So I think that's the most important thing is just um, once again, getting them to understand why this is an important service and the elements of it and um, how important it is to their bottom line. Yeah, but that's helpful. So, you know, I'm hearing from all of you about a lot of moving parts here. So, Maura, I'm wondering what's making it easier to identify subrogation claims today versus, you know, well in the past? Well, I think at, le at least for conduit, um, what I touched on in the identification component, definitely data mining, data analytics, refining algorithms, um, identifying those key indicators and using those to identify cases. You know, we're able to process data immediately upon receipt and get the cases identified, start the investigation process so it moves into the recovery workflow um, without delay. You know, so there is, we're not waiting for self-reporting from members or attorneys to notify us that they're representing someone. We're proactively identifying those cases to get a jump on them early on. Thanks, Maura. So Ryan, as our counsel here, it's your job to uh, tell us the downside. Uh, what's slowing down subrogation recoveries? Sure, yeah. Um, I wish it all ran so smoothly. Um, but, you know, honestly, if I look back in time, I think uh, we could take snapshots of when the Supreme Court decisions came out in our favor, Sarah Boff, McCutcheon. I think uh, plaintiff's lawyers were saying oh, how, how terrible it would be. And I think a lot of our industry thought, well, this is going to be easy now. And you know, we'll just send the letter out and they'll pay us. And uh, frankly, even though we've got those good decisions and, and if we had to use them, we can. Um, it's, it's as difficult now to recover, you know, as it was then, um, you know, the, the plaintiff's bar is always going to find a way to try to reduce that lien. And so right now, I, I think, we, you know, we talked about, we mentioned the lien resolution vendors, we mentioned the document requests, they're going less at what the, the legal arguments are, and they're, 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 they're trying to be disruptive at, as to the process. They, they understand your process and they want to slow it down, throw the wrench in there so that you will negotiate out of a, um, you know, basically a necessity to preserve resources and to say, well, look, I can't spend it all day working on these document requests, um, you know, jumping through hoops because it doesn't matter what it is. They're not really, they're not really after the documents. They're just throwing up obstacle after obstacle and that's the that's the the back and forth that goes on you know because if you perfectly respond and, and we do it all every day to these these requests we'll send out a perfect response and then 
it'll be another new issue that, that will come back at you. It has nothing to do. We don't, we're not even interested in the documents. We put them at, we don't even look at them. We're going to throw out a different, you know, obstacle for you to, to, to go over. So I think that's, that's just been the, the necessary back and forth with this adversarial system that we're in. Um, otherwise, I, I, I think generally, um, and I don't know if, if, if everyone's seeing it across the board, but I think that the, the pandemic has slowed things down. And I'm sure we can probably all talk about that as well. Um, but I think that that's having, that had an effect, we know for sure on cases because cases came to a, a halt and we were doing things virtu virtually and, and cases were just not moving forward, getting settled, getting resolved. Now that that's kind of picked up now that we've we implemented Zoom and depositions are going forward and cases are moving forward. But I, I think that that built in a big um, window there where cases just didn't get resolved and things got pushed back. And and now we can see it in the courts where, you know, judges, you know, courts that didn't have a trial for a month are now trying every there's a courtroom, there's a trial in every courtroom every week. So, you know, we're catching up. Thanks, Ryan. So we can close our slide now. And, and as we're talking as a panel, Deborah, I want to get to you here. You know, you shared that Trustmark um, decided to outsource subrogation efforts. And so I'm hoping you could talk about the process you went through to make that decision and, and about some of the benefits that you might now be realizing because of that decision to outsource subrogation. Yeah, I'd love to um, share on that. Just to give you a little backstory on that, what had happened is within our company back in 2005, um, we were experiencing great results um, as an internal unit. And probably part of that, a couple of years prior to that, our um, fraud and abuse department had was also experiencing great results. And so our business development went through and we created a standalone business unit, which then went to the marketplace. So then going back to looking at the subrogation um, unit and their recovery results, our CEO at the time said, well, wait a minute, maybe there's an opportunity here as well with subrogation. Um, it didn't end up that way. <laughs> as we did our research and we had a committee of several people representing different various uh, parts of the company as far as marketing, IT, business development, and so on, um, we found quickly that we were very um, short on the uh, technology part of it. And as anybody knows, IT is always a very overwhelmed area of any company. And so for us to have that ramp up time to create the technology that our competitors in the marketplace had, it just wasn't going to work. But as we were doing our research, we just we did find that, you know what, this may be a way. While we are being, being very successful internally, we do see that there's some people out in the marketplace that um, have some pretty, uh, you know, great results and great tools. So how we decided to do that is we created a, um, an RFP and we put that out. And we had responses that came back from that. The committee interviewed those parties. And then what we did is we narrowed it down. And what we did then is we narrowed it down to five candidates and we did on-site visits, very extensive on-site visits with each of those companies to see you know, what do they offer. And then the representatives from IT and um, compliance and legal, and then myself with my own um, segregation background experience, we all offered feedback. And then that's ultimately how the vendor was selected. So it was a pretty, it was a pretty thorough and took several months process, but we we feel that and we still feel that we did a great job at vetting our vendor. Thanks, thanks, Deborah. And again, time frame wise, you're saying it was a um, several month process. Several months. Yeah. Okay. All right, Maura. What are the benefits you see coming from health plans uh, when they discuss going to doing subrogation internal to doing it uh, outside with a vendor? Well, to definitely um, echo one of Deb's points, one of um, you know our, our main benefits is having the technology and the resources that a lot of internal units don't have don't have access to. It's often an investment that you know a company doesn't want want to make because it's not their their key line of business. Um, so so we have you know in terms of case identification, case monitoring, all of that, we have the technology and the resources. Um, available to us and continually improving that can really um, 
make the subrogation process run as smoothly as possible. We also have dedicated teams with, with subject matter expertise. So we have teams that investigate, we have teams that recover, we have our in-house legal support that's entirely dedicated to subrogation. Um, when it comes to an internal unit, they may not be just dedicated to subrogation. They may have multiple roles and responsibilities. Um, whereas a vendor, we provide the dedicated staff thoroughly trained and um, experts in their areas to, to make sure we're identifying and recovering everything we can. Thanks, Maura. So Ryan, what, what, what advice do you provide to your clients when they're considering what path to go down uh, for resolving subrogation claims? Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, um, one of the things that, that I want to, and, De and you know, this is, goes back to something Deb said about understanding your group's culture. And I think that, so, so it's important that I have a conversation, you know, with the client on, on why we're litigating and, and what the, what the goal is, um, you know, what the motivation is. Um, so, we, so we have a conversation. Do, do, are we doing it just for purely economic reasons? Um, you know, we've got, uh, we're just so far apart on what the numbers are. The attorney's not making a reasonable offer. And so we really don't have a choice. We're kind of getting backed into that, that situation. Um, or are we doing it for the, you know, like the greater good? Is this a principal case? Are we, are we trying to uh, make a point to a, a vendor or a lien re resolution vendor or a particular law firm? Um, and that, that's, those are different cases. We're, we're, we're looking at things differently um, and, and the case will, will turn differently. Um, you know, I can give you a couple examples that we've got uh, cases where we've had to take stands or clients have had to take stands against uh, a particular law firm that had, you know, a dozen or more cases with their employees and all personal injury, you know, all these personal injury cases with client members. And they were making the same argument as to the plan funding in every one of them. And so rather than let this continue on, um, they just had to nip it in the bud and file a suit and then address that issue that the, the attorney was raising. Um, had another group where we just had a law firm in an anti-subrogation state that just, you know, they would ignore you, ghost you, right? And then settle the case and then they would just walk away. And it's frequently they, they, in, they got away with it. You know, no one would hold them accountable. They would just uh, close files. And so someone finally got tired of it and we had to take a stand and we filed, you know, multiple cases against the firm and um, uh, were successful. And now they have a firm specific uh, process in place where, um, you know, that firm doesn't ignore letters that come in from this vendor. So um, it just depends on, 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 on the reasons. And I think that we can also, of course, then have a discussion about uh, the costs. And, and, and I'm not talking just about dollar costs, you know, attorney's fees, costs, filing fees, but really the human costs that I think that are ignored or, or just not emphasized initially. And there can be a, a, a great deal of stress put on the participant and the, the management. You know, these people come into work every day and the, the company is suing them, right? That, that's stressful. Um, there's resources that maybe we aren't thinking about that need to be redirected. It's going to take me resources uh, working with your TPA with documents and uh, generating all of the information we need for discovery. Uh, there, there's there's potentially going to be depositions of key uh, you know witnesses in, at the at the employer, um, and that's burdensome. That takes a lot of time. And, and so once we have all that you know you know in place, we can we can do a better cost benefit analysis that includes those factors. And at, at bottom, are, are we looking at trying to just are we doing this litigation over ten to twenty thousand dollars net? Uh, net improvement from what we're currently being offered? And if so, does it really justify all of those costs that we just talked about? So those are the discussions that I have, um, you know, and, and, and it all gets back to the, the culture and the reason we're doing it. Thanks, Ryan. I couldn't help but think when you talked about uh, getting around and, and stopping them from ghosting that uh, you're the Ghostbusters. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Maura, how would you help payers choose the right path for subrogation claims resolution? You know, what are some of the factors you ask them to consider as, as they're going down that path? 
Okay, and in a lot of ways, we have very similar conversations to the ones that, that Ryan just mentioned. It's just, you know, a step before it gets to a firm like Ryan, like Ryan's. Um, so we want to make sure that they have all the information they need, gathering all the facts regarding the case, um, anything that could potentially impact the decision, whether it be the extent of the injuries or the amount of money available. We give them a full picture uh, of what the scenario is um, and make sure that we're collaborating, you know, and working as partners to determine the best approach. We have our in-house legal team analyze, make their recommendation, but ultimately it is up to the client. And if the client chooses to, to move forward, then that's where we work with them to get to get the litigation going and, and go down that route. If they determine that's not necessary, then we work with them to determine what amount is acceptable to them, how, how low are they willing to go, basically. Um, and a lot of those conversations, like Ryan mentioned, surround the culture because we deal with um, self-funded groups, we deal with you know, larger payers. So we're dealing with a variety of clients, but with some of the self-funded employers, they don't want to be suing their employee or some of them do. You know, I, I think, um, you know, like Deb previously mentioned and like Ryan was talking about, it all depends on the culture. Um, so we work with our clients to determine the best approach for them based on all the, the factors of the case. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Maura. And before we get to our audience questions, Deborah, I, I um, have a question for you with all these moving parts. How, how does Trustmark juggle, juggle this? How do, how, do you try, how do you juggle optimizing recoveries you know, while maintaining and trying to keep your clients and members satisfied? Great question, Clive. <laughs> yeah, that can be a challenge. And I, I feel like I'm gonna be a little repetitive with my response, but it's once again, as much as you can know your client know their culture. Are they ones that, you know, they really, um, as Mara just said, and um, Ryan has mentioned as, as well, are they one that they don't want? They don't want to litigate. They don't even want us to pursue at all, which then we, we get into that. Well, you cannot show, you know, preferential, you know, I guess for some employees, as far as not pursuing subrogation, and then as far as for others, um, you've, got to have, you've got to watch that under ERISA. So it's just knowing your culture of the client, but then I think in having that information as far as what their culture is and, and what their approach is to segregation services, once again, another repeating theme throughout this is the education. Take the time to really educate and bring understanding to your clients um, as far as what segregation is about and the benefits of that. Because we absolutely, I mean, that's what we're there for, right? We're there to help recover paid claim dollars that were spent or put out um, as a result of negligence of another party. So we absolutely want to make sure that both the client understands that, that their employees understand that. And that just really, I think, um, brings it back home as far as the education. Um, and then the other thing as far as doing this is vendor flexibility. You know, I talk about culture, but if you've got a vendor, a segregation vendor that you're using or a firm, and they're not being, they're not willing to be flexible with what your business needs or requirements might be based upon your clients, then it's probably not going to be a good partnership. So I think finding a vendor that is, can be flexible and while doing their best to bring in recoveries at the same time, listening to what you're saying about your clients is key. Thanks, Deborah. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm now gonna jump in with uh, an audience question and let me read this. Uh, As a self-funded Taft-Hartley, we've tried on a few cases of COVID-19 hospitalization submitted as workers' comp for a few contributing employers, but every employer and their workers' comp carry has found it easy to contend the employee actually contracted COVID-19 outside of the workplace and to push those claims back to us. Any thoughts on how to deal with this? So uh, first, um, if we could, uh, Ryan, do you have any thoughts on that? Sure, and obviously that's a, a fairly common uh, you know, uh, issue now or has been in the past uh, you know, 18 months or so. Um, and what you want to look at is is when uh, is the date of of the uh, the diagnosis and the treatments um, because most states have 
or had at some point a, a statute that made a statutory presumption that the uh, COVID diagnosis was as a result of um, you know, uh, being at work. Uh, so it was occupationally related. Um, so if you've got that presumption and it's during that period, um, and obviously um, you can show that the person was not on disability, they were working during that period, then, then you, that presumption will, will work in your favor. If you're outside of that presumption period, you know, then you're going to have to, uh, you would have to potentially litigate that case and prove uh, beyond, beyond a preponderance of evidence, you know, that the, um, that the, that the COVID diagnosis was more likely related to the, to the work or more contracted at work than it was contracted off of work. Um, and that's more difficult, but, you know, depending upon, you know, dates and timelines and diagnoses and, and, um, uh, whatever the, um, you know, the, the time, the incubation period is, you, you might be able to do it. It's just not, it's not a slam dunk, you know, you, you, you want to look for those, again, those dates that fall within the statutory presumption period of the state you're in. Ryan, have you heard this being discussed much, you know, with, with those you're working with? Um, so I've, I've had, you know, just a few calls from clients with, with this issue about what to do because, uh, you know, they, they believe it's work related and we've had a few that fell within and a few that fell without. Um, and um, I only heard back on the ones where the, they fell without uh, outside that, that statutory presumption period. And, you know, the, the, the prospect of litigating the issue was not was less than ideal um, and complicated by the states we were in, you know, being being able to whether you could bring a direct claim against a work comp carrier and all sorts of things. But, um, yeah, I, it's 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 out there. Um, I, I don't know how widely it's been been talked about. I don't see any um, national resources on it other than, um, you know, publications on these uh, statutory presumptions. OK, Deborah, I'm curious, you know, from your perspective and also as our resident subrogation nerd, um, do you have uh, thoughts on this? You know, we really have not seen that. Um, it's not come up. I'm surprised that it hasn't. Um, but we're, we're not seeing that. Okay. All right. But uh, Deb, while I've got you here, I, I'm wondering if you might uh, talk to us a little about uh, if you have words of, of advice for health plans evaluating their subrogation processes, just going back to the processes. Yeah, I think the most important thing is always stay current. Um, know what's out there, any changing, anything changing on the the horizon um, coming on, that's where people like Ryan are really helpful, um, kind of have their finger on the pulse of, of states and what they might be um, looking at. And, um, but to know, to stay current, um, always have your, you know, make sure your plan language. I mean, I think that's key for any subrogation case is going to be your plan language, having that reviewed, making sure it's still nice and tight. You want to set your um, your vendors and your attorneys up for success. And the best way to do that, the best tool that they're going to have in their pocket is going to be the plan language. And I think just, you know, keep an eye on um, your business partners. You know, like I said, we have an in-house audit program of our vendors and because we want to make sure, you know, what is the case at random um, cases? What's the activity looking like? Are they following up? If an attorney has asked for a document, can we see in the case notes that that's been provided? And you know, what's the turnaround time when you're requesting information from them? Um, if the attorney is asking for something, you know, are they getting that that turned around in, in a timely manner and, and providing everything that's needed? So I think you know, just having somebody that can kind of work with and I and um, I know we do that with Conduit. They appreciate it. They're, they're aware of it. We provide feedback. And I think it's it's created a, a strong relationship between our companies as a result. So I think those are the key things. And, and just because something's been working well, um, don't just sit there. Continue, you know, every once in a while, take a step back and, and look at your program. Look at your processes. Do they still make sense? Or is there a better way now with technology or other things that are going on that me uh, a little tweak would be helpful? Thanks, Deborah. Yeah. And, and so, you know, with this, we're going to wrap up now. And, and so I want to thank so much Deborah Whaley, Maura uh, Yerke, and Ryan Woody for a whole lot of expertise you've uh, shared. Um, 
believe me, I, I learned a lot. So thank you again to our speakers. Thank you again to the audience. And this concludes our webinar session. <laughs>